Thank you. Uh, I hope I didn't scare a lot of people. It seems like we're down to a rarefied group. <laughs> My goodness, I, I was trying to get a little more acquainted with everybody. That's why I attended the earlier sessions. Hmm. All right. <clears throat> well, I would like to present um, Yeah, I think that's what it is. I would like to present one sec. Here we go. We're on. Okay. Here we are. Since I've been in high school, I mean, since I've been an early teen, I've been pondering this question that has been bothering me. And that is, what is the difference between good and evil? What's the problem? with uh, sin and all this and how do we even know what's going on so today's presentation i've entitled visions of love the reason in a nutshell is because it is quite simply not possible to understand things properly if we do not love. Now, how do we get to that conclusion? Let's look at things a little bit. Our entire planet is populated with innumerable living organisms. In fact, any gram of soil has more than 10,000 little organisms in it. And there isn't a place on the planet that doesn't have some life form on it. Every one of these life forms, somewhere in it, has information. Our general cell looks, uh, is represented here um, uh, as a eukaryotic cell, for example. Uh, complete with all the organelles, mitochondria, Golgi bodies, the smooth and rough endoplasmic reticulum, various vacuoles, specialized uh, tubules, uh, and centrioles and such. And in the nucleus, we find the repository, the library, if you will, of all the information to which the cell refers to whenever it needs to figure out how to do something. So, let's think about that information a little bit. Information is encoded in the DNA. The genetic information is specially coded. A sequence of millions of deoxyribonucleotides and just for a bacterium like E. coli, just to write out the sequence would take over a thousand pages. That's for a bacterium. Uh, these big piles here that you see that look like walls, those are stacks of 3,000 phone books that in a very picturesque manner represent the amount of information present in a human eukaryotic cell. Did I hear a wow? <laughs> I mean, we're talking, it's not a little bit of information. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, it's a lot. Wow. If E. coli has 1,000 pages, our human cell has 3,000 phone books worth. You understand? And yet on top of that is the complexity of how all that information is processed, how it's operating, how it's analyzed, how it functions. So, 
information itself cannot possibly be thought of as passive. We have grown up, I have grown up thinking of information as somehow like it's in a book and you put a book down, that's where the information is. It's not doing anything. But that information is actually powerful. It's not passive. It can be descriptive, it can be prescriptive, it can be directive, it can be executive or operational. Genetic information in cells performs all of these. And viral information, when it enters the cell, takes over the cell's host cell machinery and hijacks it for its own purposes, making virus, instead of what the cell would normally be making. That is food for thought because we ordinarily think that we are masters of our own thinking. Could that be an illusion? Could it be that we were intended to be masters, but somewhere along the way, we have given up that or we have lost it or we never even knew that we were supposed to be masters. Something somewhere along the way took over and we became slaves. Like the cell that is doing the virus's bidding. So let's look at the more ordinary situation. Let's think in terms of computer programming. Is anybody in this group uh, familiar with computer programming? Anybody? Speak now. <laughs> okay. Well, computer program is itself executive, ex executable information. Uh, computer programs can run machines that would be robotics, or they can process information. But there is a whole new mm, category of adaptive programs that can learn from personal experience and from outside information that is fed into the program. So the questions, is information itself value neutral? And what is the difference between naivete, between error, and between, between naivete, error, and disinformation? And what is it that is essential for learning? Okay, let's have a look. This is from 1995 from Scientific American, where uh, the article was discussing a computer program that was analyzing stock market for the purpose of learning how to do trades in order to make profit. And please uh, look at the um, blue line that's if there is no outside help from anybody, just by trial and error, the computer program ultimately learns from its own mistakes. And after about 150 days of trial and error begins making some profit. Uh, and we can see that going forward. And by about 250 days, it has reached about 5% annualized return on investment from the program's own trades. Yes. But we thought, well, let's say that if we teach the pro tell the program something so that it doesn't have to start from zero with total tabula rasa. Uh, let's say that we tell the program some information that would be helpful 
such as the symmetry of um, currency exchanges. What works with one currency, when that currency is down, will work for another currency when that one happens to be down, or something analogous to that. Well, when, when such information is fed into the program, the program is able to learn to generate some profit sooner. It doesn't have to learn everything from scratch because it now knows something to begin with. And so the dark blue line, you see, is making profit much sooner. And by the time 250 days have come around, it is almost reaching 10% annualized profit per trade. So then the question is, but what if we had given it some kind of, shall we say, irrelevant hint that wasn't, that wasn't either helpful or misleading? Well, then the irrelevant hint, kind of like saying, well, the weather was such and such somewhere else. And it turned out that it didn't do much. It didn't really affect things a whole lot. But if we gave the program a hint that turned out to be incorrect, false, then the program started losing money and accelerated losing money over time. It was never able to recover from loss, losing money because of that one false hint. No amount of learning could recover from the false information that it has absorbed as truth. Why is that? Because the program had no way of testing what it was told. It was testing its own experience, but it was assuming that what it was told was the gospel truth. And so it assumed if that's the truth, then something else has to give. So it essentially implicitly redefined what the meaning of profit was. So it's still maximizing. The program is working perfectly. It's still maximizing profit. It's just that now the meaning of the word profit is different. Now it's identified with losses. Uh, so you might ask yourself, but how long can that go? When the program loses all the money, it will simply have to stop because it can't trade with nothing. Well, you're right. At that point, it would that would be the end. That's, that's kind of like a terminal condition. But by that point, it would have lost everything it had to trade with. So now the question that comes to mind. Well, first of all, observations. Computer program is working perfectly regardless of success or failure. The accepted information determines the outcome. Learned truths lead to more profit sooner. Learned false truths lead to increased losses. No amount of learning can overcome one false truth. The false truth redefines the meaning of profit and loss. Then the answers. Information is not value neutral. Truth leads to profit, falsehood leads to losses. Naivety means lack of experience or knowledge. Learning occurs by trial and error. Disinformation is a deliberate misleading. Trust is essential so that learning can occur. So then, Having now seen this, 
what then is sin? First of all, what are the minimal requirements for learning? Well, we need to have trust. If we can't even trust our own senses, we can't learn from our own experiences. That means personal experience means we have to be able to learn something from whatever experience we had and then do better next time. But we can also learn from others who've already experienced something. This is like education and mentoring. If every single person on earth had to reinvent the wheel, we would not have much progress, would we? The reason why we have progress is because to a large degree, we're able to learn from one another. So then there are issues. What about seductive falsehoods? Do I still prefer the truth? What about idols and ideologies? Do I still trust the right principles? What about disinformation? Do I deliberately deceive someone? And how about hostile intent? The question is, what is the objective? And the choices continue. And so we make many little choices which add up over a lifetime of experience to very divergent outcomes. So I would like to give you a parable of three brothers. Three brothers lived and worked happily in their family business. They fought and celebrated, joked and laughed, and supported one another and pondered together many things. One day, one of the three died in a tragic accident that profoundly affected the remaining two brothers. They experienced deep grief that seemed like it could not end. Sometime later, they reflected on their experience of loss. Brother understanding, going through the valley of pain, losing my brother, helped me to treasure the, th the time I have the privilege of sharing with my family and friends. The pain I experienced gains meaning if it helps me to be more supportive of someone in difficulty. I would be glad to serve if I can be of any help to reduce suffering when someone else is in need. Brother Strong, going through grief because of family trouble made me vulnerable. I must recover quickly so that I'm no longer vulnerable. When someone else is in trouble, that is a time when they're vulnerable. This could be an opportunity if I were to take advantage of their unfortunate circumstances. If I do things right, I should be able to advance my interests in bad times as well as good. So superficially speaking, it is not faulty logic or incorrect evidence that leads one to dramatically different conclusions from another. Implicit choices we make in our considerations are based on how we see reality and our place in it. No amount of factual education can have an impact on this. We're following a very different set of values that we may not even be aware of, those we have implicitly chosen. If we asked understanding what he thought about his brother Strong, he would probably say something like, uh, yeah, it seems to me my brother is still grieving. I wish I knew what to say or do to help him recover soon. However, if we asked Strong what he thought about understanding, he might say something like, our family tragedy affected him deeply and if he can't come out of it, he will never amount to anything. So one may ask, 
what attracts us to our individual world views and why do we become so protective of it even though we may be unaware that we have adopted it the answer seems to be it helps us make sense of our lives and the universe we live in if someone were to try to challenge this Weltanschauung, we would feel an immediate sense of disorientation and a strong desire for more solid footing of familiar territory. The new model would be summarily rejected because it is disorienting. Our minds desperately try to make sense. The corollary. How do we develop a particular worldview which we ultimately adopt as obvious? The hundreds and thousands of everyday choices we make form the perspective, the panorama, and the horizons of our individual worldviews. The challenge is what if some of these choices are less than optimal? Ordinarily, this would lead to contradictory interactions with other choices of higher merit, leading one to attempt a resolution by a higher order choice between them. The mind just keeps trying to make sense, but we have to make those choices. So how do we know when we are making the best sense? And the great problem, what is the ultimate best sense and how do we find it? Now, the big challenge, ladies and gentlemen, how do we deal with encountered discordance between our personal worldview and some aspect of reality? A collision with the obvious, if you might ask. This is like attempting to repair a ship on high seas in stormy weather. Encountering this kind of experience while under impact of some personal stressors or upheaval is like being in the middle of a spiritual war while on high seas in bad weather. One is at a loss to even know how to think. This was the experience of Peter and of Judas. And it helped Peter turn in the right direction. Sadly, Judas could not see it. And the solution, it may be difficult to see things clearly when personal worldviews are challenged. However, there is solid footing even in such circumstances. The real question is not whether a personal worldview serves well, but does one see facts and issues as they really are? Truth remains solid footing regardless of discomforts experienced. And truth will set you free. The question, what are the truths that remain solid when all other things crumble? Well, in the beginning, God. That is an essential truth that we all have, have to come to terms with sooner or later. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. It's like the computer program. If you had two computer programs that got to one got one hint that went to higher profit, and the other one got uh, shall we say, the false hint that led to higher losses, the performance of the programs diverged dramatically. Yes? 
there is a divergence. Darkness simply cannot look at light and understand it as light because that's it doesn't have the right framework from which to see it that way. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Once the program is infected with false information, it cannot save itself. It needs a savior from outside, one who's going to challenge the truthfulness of that falsehood so that the program can, can correct its information database. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Well, do we prefer truth or do we prefer convenience? Do we prefer understanding or do we wish winning? You know, when I was, I, I presented the parable of the brothers in Sabbath school settings um, several times and in classroom settings several times. And then I asked two questions. Which of the two brothers would you like as your neighbor? When, and the second question was, which of the two brothers would you like to be? Whenever I asked the first question, there was a unanimous vote. Everybody immediately votes for the first brother, understanding. We want him as our neighbor. But when I asked the second question, and which one do you want to be? And then, uh, then it was a little more ambiguous. Then some people would say, yes, but the second brother is a good man too. And so would be the feedback. What does that tell us? That tells us that we know what is good, but we do not trust that good will lead us to success. Is it possible that our definition of success has been already affected by the world in some manner? Okay, so how do we gain a a better perspective. Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins and not one of them is forgotten before God, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear therefore you are worth much more worthy than many sparrows. Why does God see every sparrow and even every hair on our heads? The answer to that question is because he loves. Well, that's, that's how John 3, 16 explains to us. A conclusion, when one loves, one is interested in the beloved. One is not interested in oneself. One doesn't merely see the beloved, one also sees through the eyes of the beloved. So God doesn't merely see the sparrow, he sees through the eyes of the sparrow. He feels the sparrow's joys and sorrows, hopes and fears, not just for the sparrow, but also every other creature, every individual member of that species. In short, God sees reality from every perspective. Now that's vision. When we 
love, we also see from perspective of others. It is a mind expanding experience. That is why we feel so alive. We become free from the constraints of self. We're no longer limited merely to one lifetime of personal experiences. Now we have access to the experiences of another. What about selfishness? Well, selfishness reverses love's vision until we only see what we want and we think we're winning. But what implies a re but I mean, that implies a redefining of the meaning for winning. What happens when we collide with the obvious? Of the two brothers, which one is more likely to succeed? And the question is, do both of them actually see success the same way? And here is, here are the, is the message to the Laodicean church that says, because you say I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich in white garments that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. So there is a problem. We have a problem of vision. When we become preoccupied with self, we suffer blindness, regardless of what it is we've got, regardless of how many successes we have listed we become blind. So we have a choice. Choice one, a life of loving service. We care, study, labor, maybe even sacrifice to be useful and to contribute something of lasting value. Other people, just as they are, are priceless sources of growth and insight. Choice number two, a life of personal interests. We care, study, labor, maybe even sacrifice to gain more of something we want for ourselves. Other people are mostly irrelevant. They may be threats to our goals or may be helpful for their advancement. The question is, which are we going to choose? Over time, the myriad little choices we make put us on a trajectory towards one or the other of these. Questions? Wow, thank you. Um, I guess I, I have a question I could ask um, on the topic of, of viruses and, and you were mentioning, um, you kind of related it to sin as well, how it kind of takes over the cell and kind of uses the cell to feed its own purpose. Um, right. Are there any kind of ways in which the body itself kind of shows this visions of love in terms of how it fights off a virus or any kind of disease in that sense? Like how is love portrayed also in the biological processes of our body? That's always something that, that interested me in, and I don't know if you have an answer to that. May I offer a suggestion? For sure. Um, our bodies have an immune system the immune system analyzes the, the the breakdown products of pathogens as well as the various breakdown products of our own cells 
whenever there is any kind of disruption or destruction that happens anywhere in the body, our immune system is monitoring what's going on. And it is constantly learning. And when it sees the presence of a pathogen with some cell debris, it concludes that that pathogen has been associated with cell destruction. Therefore, it identifies that pathogen as something that has to be confronted. Therefore, a whole cell line is set up to develop antibodies against a specific pathogen. In fact, not just one cell line, but numerous cell lines are attempting to develop antibodies simultaneously against the same pathogen, but targeting different aspects of the pathogen. Because our body, we don't know which access point or which approach is going to be most effective. So we, we try everything. Ultimately, one of those approaches works, one type of antibody works, and when it works, that is going to be the one that's amplified the most. And so that helps to resolve the infection. This is what happens every time we have an infection of some kind. But what happens when we bought into a bad idea while thinking that it is a wonderful idea? We have spiritual issues that we have to deal with. We as human beings can attach ourselves to anything. Do we choose to attach ourselves to something that is of, uh, shall we say, greater value, more noble, perhaps more permanent, more lasting? Or do we choose to attach ourselves to whatever happens to be my current fancy? I will never forget a 60 minute interview with the most prolific serial killer that was ever caught in North America. He had apparently, it was documented that he had killed more than 85 women. And the policeman would ask him, so why would you do that? And he would say, well, you know, as I was choking the light, life out of her, she was struggling for her life and I was struggling for my pleasure. How did he get to the stage where he had pleasure in someone else's death? That is just like the program that now thinks that losses means profit. You see, we need to have an objective standard. We cannot just say, because I feel this way must be right. We have to have an objective standard. This is why God's standard to love God above all and love your neighbor as yourself is the rule according to which the whole universe functions. And there is no problem, there is no conflict. But when people begin to think that winning is, well, if I'm going to win, that means that somebody else must be losing. That's how you define winning. You know, by, by one wins because another one loses. Yes, it would be nice to have win-win strategies, but then you're not thinking in terms of winning. Then you're thinking in terms, can we advance things a little bit? Can we make things better? 
you know, <laughs> does that make sense? It's a different kind of thinking. If we think in terms of what do I get out of this, then we're going to go down one pathway. If we think in terms of how does this contribute to something more lasting, then I'm going to likely go a different pathway. Do I see humility and uh, do I see love as being of value? Do I see humility, for example, as a weakness and love as merely an affectation? Or do I see humility as wisdom and love as a vision? I mean, do you, do you see the, the, and this is so fundamental, so basic. I, I hate to use the word fundamental because here in the States, people suffer from, from some baggage about fundamentalism. <clears throat> What I wish to actually say, there are some issues which are foundational. If, if there is no foundation, then you can never actually know which way you're heading. And picking up any idea could send you in, in some weird direction. So how do we screen ideas that are coming in? How do we select which ideas are legitimate and which ones are not? Uh, and uh, according to what criteria? Uh, I would recommend the life of Christ as a wonderful revelation of God. Because that shows us how God sees leadership, how God sees what's of value. Thank you. Those were helpful. Any other? Anybody else? Are you the only one left? Did everybody leave? No, no there's, there's uh, 11, 11 of us. People. Oh, oh, so there has been some accrual. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to see. Well, let's see. Oh, okay. Oh, mostly in the dark. <clears throat> Just, uh, I guess, uh, Doctor, since you have a, 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 a few minutes left. Huh? Yes, please. Uh, since we have a few minutes left, I guess it would be great if you could tell us how do we take that uh, first step to uh, practically apply visions of love in our life? If I may, the first thing is we need to recognize that concepts are not, how should I say, innocuous. We think we're masters of our own thinking, but that is an illusion. Our thinking is mastering us far too often. You recall how God spoke to Cain. He said, sin is at your door, but you're the master. Well, Cain did not think in terms of mastering anything. He just thought that whatever he thought was the most important thing. And so he was not mastering. Instead, he was mastered by it. And Jesus said that whoever sins is a slave to sin. The reason is because it causes the redefinition of how we see things. We no longer see things the way they ought to be seen. 
the way they really are. But we see them in a different light, and according to that light, we seem to think that, oh, we're right. I'm right. And, and sometimes people go to all kinds of struggles and fights and everything else. And the first place humility would have helped avoid all that. Humility, realizing that of our own, we cannot be helped. We must have a savior to bring the truth, what is the genuine truth, from outside. We cannot help ourselves any more than that program that has taken up a false truth can now make profit. Even though it is doing everything correctly, it needs a savior. We need a savior because we have bought into an idea of survival of the fittest and such. And as long as we keep running with those ideas, we're, we're headed in the wrong direction. We need to recognize that if we cannot see how God sees things, at least to some degree, then we're doomed. So, how do we begin to see how God sees? Well, what did God instruct everybody with? What are the first and the, the biggest commandments? Love God and love your neighbor. Dostoevsky wrote a long essay on his experience and planned suicide because he felt that life was meaningless and while he and he wrote in great detail all his thinking along the way he concluded that life is pointless meaningless and amounting to nothing and while he was thinking about that he had a dream and in the dream, he saw, he was walking down the street and a little girl walked up to him and asked him, Mr. Can you help me? And he just brushed her aside and moved on. And when he got up, he remembered, I still remember the little girl saying, Mr. Can you help me? Why does that, the vision of that little girl bother me? I mean, who is she to me? I don't know her at all. Uh, I've never seen her. I, I, why does it disturb me? I have to work this out before I kill myself. So, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So he kept thinking about it and suddenly it occurred to him. The meaning of life is to love another. And it is so simple. He discovered, wow. <laughs> you know, we're not complicated. So God already gave us the protections to love protects you think that being loved is the thing that everybody aims for that is infantile every infant loves to be loved of course who doesn't but we have to mature at some point we have to realize the freeing from self that occurs when we start to love. Love protects the lover far more than it protects the loved. How? Because it protects us from deviant thinking, from every manner of um, uh, 
fixations on uh, attachments to all kinds of nonsense like like that serial killer i mean how did he ever get to the idea that that there is a thrill in choking the life out of somebody why would that be a thrill i don't get it but to him it was now you see if he had thought about love and the thrill of seeing things through another's point of view. Think about it. Look at it this way. Did you realize that love actually enables us to transcend space and time? And you're saying, huh? What? We're talking physics now. Well, in a manner of speaking, yes, but for that requires higher level of thinking, not less. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> How so? Very simple. We're all basically locked in one lifetime. Even if it, it's eternal lifetime, it's still one. It's whatever you've been doing. But when you interact with another through love, when you experience the point of view of the other, you now see things from their view that enriches you. You don't have to think, oh, they want me to think their way. I don't want to do that. That is the problem. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You, you want to see from more points of view. If you can look at anything from just one point of view, you would have limitations, would you not? You're limited. When you see things from multiple points of view, you are no longer limited the same way. You're transcending those limits, but you are doing it the right way. You're not just taking something that belongs to someone else. Does that make sense to anybody? Does it appeal to you? Do you yeah, like it? So. Man, you gotta love it. You we, had, we had a, a few amen. Uh, love it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Now think about it. You know, I have a beagle. That beagle loves. He's so devoted. He's so faithful. I feel he's gonna get to heaven well before me. In fact, I, I may have to tell him to put in a good word for me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so think about in heaven being able to interact with beings all over the universe all kinds of beings think what would it be like if you could talk to a dolphin what could you learn from their point of view what would they tell us and what would we tell them if they asked what is it like being human and we would say well we argue a lot <laughs> you know what i'm saying well isn't there something better <laughs> <laughs> is that the first thing we want to tell them? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If we're going to talk to someone else somewhere in the universe, what will we share with them? And what will they share with them? I mean, can you just imagine the experience of seeing things from all these different ways of doing things, of different ways of living, different ways of being. Is that not rich? Is that not a privilege? <coughs> Indeed it is. Uh, 
thank you so much for that uh, passionate response and for your presentation today. I know we've been uh, blessed because of it. Uh, and so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Danilo, for uh, joining us multiple times in the month of May and for uh, sharing with us uh, this, uh, this, this, uh, this unique perspective on visions of love. And I know that uh, for those of us who are here and who, who've heard it, we will take it away and uh, it will really be a blessing to us in our, in our daily lives. So uh, thank you for that. God bless everyone. And for those of us on the call, I just want to say thank you. For those of you who've been on all of the calls uh, and if you've joined any of the meetings, uh, it's been a blessing to do this Vesper series in the month of May. Uh, you know, all good things except salvation through Christ Jesus must come to its end. And so we have uh, reached the end of uh, this good experience. But I'm going to encourage you all to still keep in contact with each other. Uh, and uh, truly, ACF will have something else coming up soon. Uh, we don't know what that is yet, but there'll be something coming soon down the pipelines. And when that comes, uh, you'll be the first to know. <laughs> All right. So with that, and thank you everyone for coming. I'm going to uh, ask if uh, the preacher man of God himself, uh, the inevitable, uh, the inimitable uh, Pastor uh, Bishop John Marvin Scott uh, could uh, close us off with a word of prayer. <laughs> you know, they, get, they say that flattery will get you everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> It's just practicing being loving. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> That's a lot of showering of blessings there, you know. <laughs> I just got off of a, ser a service over at uh, Milton and, and Guelph, so I missed the first part of it. And I'm still trying to stay in touch with the uh, teens one. Uh, they have their conversation that started at 7.30, so they're probably going to end in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. Um, lots going on. But uh, it's good. Thank you so much, uh, Danilo, for, for being with us tonight. And you've been with us through the whole time of May. And, and everyone who was able to be with us throughout, I want to thank you for your presence. And Keel and Isabella, thank you for your work uh, behind the scenes to make ACF um, here in Ontario reality. And all the leaders, thank you so much for coming through. Um, and I see a lot of people who stayed back. That's great. So, well, let's pray and thank God for this time that we spent together. Father, we're so grateful. Thank you, God, for <clears throat> bringing us together in this virtual re reality. Thank you for the lessons. Although I missed uh, the commentaries, um, I missed the lessons that were presented tonight, but I know that those who attended uh, received truly a blessing. Thank you for your uh, spirit's presence in our lives and thank you for uh, your presence here tonight, which we can feel. And we thank you, O oh God, for your transformative power in our lives to change and to make whole. We pray for every president who's on the call and every person who's of our ACF chapters. We pray a blessing upon each of them. May they continue to be guided by your spirit. May they live out their life for you. Bless Akil and Isabella for the work that they're doing, and for the leadership that they have given to this ministry, this unique ministry on the public campus. Bless and sustain them and provide for their every needs. And all of our families represented here, and as, especially Danilo, our guest who has been with us every Friday night this month, we thank you for his presence and thank you for his presentation. Pour back into him blessing that he deser deserves tonight. And may we all experience a wonderful and a fr fruitful weekend filled with your blessings. Thank you, God, for hearing and answering our prayers today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.